Welcome to this video lecture series on sustainability. My name is Marion Brown. I'm the Special Assistant for Campus and Community Sustainability at Ithaca College. And I want to talk to you today about the Ithaca College Climate Action Plan, what it is and how we got there. Uh, so back in uh, 2007, then President Peggy R. Williams uh, signed the American College and University President's Climate Commitment which pledged Ithaca College to a pathway to become carbon neutral at some point in the future. And for us, the clock started ticking. When President Williams signed that commitment, what she signed us on to were these steps. Uh, basically, we had to immediately convene an all-college group to be able to guide uh, the development and implementation of the plan. And then within a year, uh, we were to complete a comprehensive inventory of all our greenhouse gas emission sources on campus uh, and then pledge to make those documents public and continue to make to document our progress and make that public. Uh, the interesting thing about this process was for the step 1B, before President Williams ever signed this, she knew exactly what our climate emissions were because uh, we had had a series of student projects in environmental studies who'd been calculating that for us. So we knew uh, for as far back as 2000 how large our carbon emission footprint was, if you will. Uh, back in 2000, it was about 33,000 metric tons of CO2 emissions. Uh, 2007 became our baseline year, and in 2007, we actually were a little bit lower than in 2000. Um, we were at just under 33,000 metric tons. Um, and again, going into the process, President Williams knew that we had already started a p uh, pattern from some of the steps we were taking on campus to lower our emissions, even though we were not necessarily deliberately thinking about those decisions in that way. So it was a fairly easy uh, a task for her to sign on to this because, again, we were already taking steps that were putting us in the right direction. So we also committed to, within two years, uh, to finish our document and start our climate action plan. So we had to fi figure out what our target date would be, uh, develop interim targets and goals that we would use to track our progress, and then make public our actions that we were going to take to do that. So our climate action plan, uh, since President Williams signed the document in 2007, was due in September of 2009. And we set the target of uh, 100% by 2050. This means that in what ultimately becomes a 40-year plan implemented in 2010, starting that year, our, our academic year, we need to maintain about a 2.5% per year reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Now that doesn't seem t like too much and again is 33, under 33,000 metric tons a lot or a little? Uh, I can tell you it's a lot but we'll get We'll get to there. The President's Climate Commitment also urged us to take some interim steps. And again, happily for us, we already had taken some of those steps before the President ever signed the Climate Commitment. Um, one thing we did do during the period of our development, uh, Climate Action Plan development process, we adopted a policy that all new campus construction would be built at least to the U.S. Green Building LEED Silver Standard or equivalent. Uh, we did approve that, um, and again, that was somewhat easy for us because at that time, we had just completed the Park Center for Sustainable uh, Enterprise uh, here on campus, which is a LEED Platinum building, uh, and we had the Peggy R. Williams building under construction at the same time that was being, again, built to LEED Platinum standards because we had already learned uh, from the experience with the Park Center that building to those standards saves the college money in energy costs, so it's just a smart way to go. So that was an easy one for us to adopt carrying forward. Although, um, in our case, we actually took this particular statement a little bit further, and we added the caveat that we would build not just new buildings, but that any buildings that we were going to undergo uh, major renovations in would also be built to this new LEED Silver Standard or better. Uh, we also adopted the Energy Star um, certification for new appliances and equipment where that standard applies. Uh, again, that was an easy one because most of the areas on campus were already doing that. We were buying 
Energy Star rated uh, appliances for dining hall uh, or dining hall areas for residence hall kitchen areas. Uh, we were buying Energy Star compliant computer equipment, uh, office equipment. So it was not a huge stretch for us to just say, okay, we'll do that going forward. Again, Energy Star basically mandates that you're going to save uh, minimally about 25% on uh, energy use over non-Energy non Star uh, equipment and it doesn't cost you any more so why wouldn't you do it? Uh, these were easy wins for us to be able to, to do. In the area of uh, setting a policy of offsetting greenhouse gas emissions generated by air travel, we're still pending on that one. Uh, that's, that's an ongoing discuss discussion that we have and you'll find, you'll see more down the road about what that impact might be. Uh, but going in, we already were underwriting uh, transit use for faculty and staff for commuting and underwriting uh, a portion, about a third of student bus passes. So this was easy for us to be able to, to tick off as something we were already doing. Um, in the area of, and again, these were suggestions. We didn't have to do all of these. We were supposed to do uh, at least a few of them, but uh, we didn't have to do all of them, and some of them we will not do or uh, we uh, aren't going to do in the short term. Buying green power, we already were buying green power for the two lead building projects, um, although it doesn't meet the 15%, uh, and that's still under consideration about how we might expand that. The committee to look at uh, climate and sustainability shareholder proposals, uh, that's not something that we probably are going to do going forward. Um, I say here it's still under consideration, but uh, we don't manage our portfolio of investments in a manner that would allow us to do that readily. So. Uh, but we have been participating in waste uh, minimization efforts, uh, especially in RecycleMania, which is an all uh, an intercollege competition that happens in the spring. Uh, with about 600 uh, institutions participate to challenge one another to increase their recycling rates. We've been participating since they allowed us to, and uh, so that that was again an easy win going in. Uh, we already were doing that, and then we. Uh, pledged to make our reports public, our inventories and our climate action plan and our status reports of the implementation. We're doing all of those things. So when we started our climate action planning process, uh, the all college group getting together, we actually started from a place you might not expect and that was we asked ourselves, what if we didn't do anything? What if we just ignored that the president had signed this climate commitment and committed us to this aggressive climate uh, carbon emissions reduction goal, what what would happen? Uh, certainly we would have egg on our face, but what might happen absent that um, from us condu conducting business as usual? So working with a team of consultants, we actually did some of the uh, assessment work of what might happen. And uh, these are ongoing dis discussions at uh, national governmental levels about uh, cap and trade proposals. So if, in fact, we do get to a point where we have the political will to adopt something like a cap-and-trade proposal, um, which basically is um, an allowance for power producers, uh, large power plants, to be capped at the amount of emissions they can produce, but if they come in under it, that then they're able to sell or trade the um, credits that they have for their mitigation efforts to others as a financial tool. But if that comes in, it starts to force some changes in the system, some of which were already going to happen um, by virtue of some of the commitments that have been made at the New York State level. But we also took a look at what if cap and trade comes in at a national level coupled with what we have. And we discovered that if we don't do anything, we're still going to pay uh, because we'll bear the cost of compliance in higher energy costs. So if we don't do anything and we just have to continue to, to pay higher and higher prices for our purchased electricity, we're going to have to be paying those costs anyway. They'll be passed on to us. And we looked at with a complicated uh, uh, economic uh, evaluation of this, but looked at the, uh, the outcome of that over this 40-year period and determined that if we don't do anything, that it would still would cost us about on the order of $25 million over that 40 years from not doing anything. So that didn't seem exactly uh, the way we wanted to go. We, wanted, we knew we didn't want to stay at the business as usual case. There's another way out, uh, and this was alluded to in some of the steps that we could take, uh, buying offsets. And this is sort of the reference case. 
This is what happens if you basically um, buy your way out of your problem. And there was one institution that signed the president's climate commitment, a very small institution, I would say, that doesn't have anywhere near our uh, environmental footprint, uh, our emissions footprint. And they just committed to buying offsets to mitigate the whatever they have on an annual basis and declared themselves carbon neutral. That is a way out. That's just a financial instrument to basically say you can buy an offset that says for the 33,000 metric tons that we produce each year, let's say we, we spend $100 per ton um, of to buy an offset that basically means that we can continue to do that, but th that money goes elsewhere, perhaps to clean up the electricity grid, perhaps for renewable energy projects or whatever. But that's just a financial cost. It just buys our way out. And um, over the 40 years, we did that evaluation. And to, to use that strategy would cost us upwards of $15 million over that 40 years. So again, if we don't do anything and just buy our way out, it's still going to cost us $15 million. So it seemed to us uh, on the committee that whether it's $15 million or $25 million over 40 years, that money is much better spent in strategic investments in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. So where did we start uh, with that frame of reference? What our base portfolio shows us is um, taking a look at, first of all, what are our sources of emissions? So again, I mentioned that our baseline number was 33, just under 33,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalents from that 2007 baseline. And the reason we, the sort of the uh, metric unit, if you will, of greenhouse gas emissions is CO2 equivalents, metric tons of CO2 equivalents. You sometimes see that as MTCOE, shorthanded. Um, there are obviously a number of greenhouse gases. CO2 is the one that gets the most press. Uh, methane, though, is far less volume in the, in the environment, but has a much more profound climate-altering effect um, by virtue of the way it acts. And there are others. There's sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide, a whole host of other greenhouse gases. Um, but they sort of levelize, levelize them all out and talk about CO2 equivalents. So we're working in that framework, um, as all the other institutions are. So we all know what we're doing and what we're talking about. So as you see the MTCDE, it's the, the uh, metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So there's three major areas um, called scopes of carbon emissions. Scope one uh, is the direct greenhouse gas emissions from sources that we own. This is basically where we combust something on campus. And in our case, the biggest part of that is natural gas that we use to heat our buildings. We burn natural gas in the boilers in each building to heat those buildings. We also burn a small amount in the college fleet, uh, basically gasoline or diesel fuel that runs around uh, the vehicles on campus, and then a very, very tiny fraction that's related to refrigerants in uh, chillers, air conditioning chillers or fertilizers that go onto some of our fields, very small amount. And I'll show you uh, how those break out. Scope two for us is the biggest portion. This is purchased electricity. And this is called indirect greenhouse gas emissions because, again, we're not generating electricity here on campus. We buy it from someone else. So we're responsible for those purchases uh, or for those emissions that are caused at the power plant level. So it's called indirect. It doesn't happen here on campus, but it happens because we are calling for that electricity demand. And then the last area, scope three, it's kind of a catch-all area. Um, but the biggest area here is commuting uh, and business travel. Solid waste generation uh, is another piece of it, and you'll start to see then why uh, in solid waste generation, why we're working mean meaningfully to reduce the amount of material we send to the landfill and try to divert it into recycling or composting. So again, two-thirds of our impact, if you look at scope one and scope two, because purchased electricity is lighting and powering uh, things in um, buildings and natural gas is heating those buildings, uh, accounts for, at least it did in 2007, for just about three-quarters of our impact, our, our emissions impact. But we do have a significant uh, quarter of our impact related to commuting and air travel. So again, I break it down a little bit to show you electricity in scope two, the red section, is 
electricity. Uh, it sort of accounts for everything. But you see some of the breakdown in scope one uh, with the direct combustion on campus, mostly um, natural gas combustion, as I mentioned, and just a tiny bit for the gasoline that runs our fleet. We don't have a huge fleet, uh, and it's even smaller amount for the fertilizers and chemicals that we're using. Uh, but you see what the breakdown is in that scope three, the, uh, uh, the commuting area especially, big areas there. Uh, and as we evaluated all of our options um, for what we could do on campus, we put them through what we called a triple bottom line plus evaluation. So here was one of the things that we looked at. This was actually something we knew was a workable strategy and it contributed greatly to some of the changes we had already seen in our emissions profile coming down before the president even signed that climate commitment. Um, but lighting upgrades is a relatively inexpensive, powerful way of doing this. But you see what we did um, to be able to put through uh, some of the thinking about this from a sustainability decision-making framework, which I've talked about before, and that is asking what's the environmental impact, what's the economic impact, what's the social impact. And then I say it's triple bottom line plus because we also overlaid this with sort of an institutional perspective of how does this impact overall how the, how the institution functions. And so for a lighting upgrade, uh, you can see below we have uh, sort of this green, yellow, red. You don't see what one here. But we used green for all systems are go. This is a great choice. Yellow is a caution light, much as you have on a traffic signal. Red would be a real stopper. Let's say some of these would be very expensive to implement. And you'll see some of these down the line where you might have seen a big red in the economic piece where you'd have a high cost, even if you'd have a high impact. But in the social area, uh, what's kind of interesting here is while lighting upgrades we knew from certainly an environmental perspective and from an economic perspective made a tremendous amount of sense, the most sustainable light bulb you can have is the one you never turn on. But those have impacts for public safety, for uh, feeling secure in a space. So obviously you have to balance taking lights to a really economically and environmentally low level um, that would be beneficial and balancing that with the social needs to keep the lights on at a level that are really workable and, and allow for productivity and, and uh, safety needs. But from an institutional standpoint, we looked at this and said, okay, you know, all of the other systems are generally good to go. What does it say about us as an institution if we do a lighting upgrades? Well, it might say we're a modern institution, we're using the latest technology. Um, it's, I would say it's a demonstration of our stewardship, uh, that we're being effective stewards of the money that our students are providing to us in forms of tuition, which basically are our financial underpinning uh, in large part. So again, here are some of the major impact areas, and you don't have to look at it. Basically, if it's in red, it costs us money um, in terms of capital costs. Uh, and these are not in... Um, dollars, these are actually in millions of dollars, uh, so you have to, we just didn't use all of the zeros here. But uh, for lighting upgrades, for instance, a relatively modest $2 million capital cost, over 40 years this is, uh, but the savings would be on the order of $5 million. So, and a relatively significant uh, contribution towards uh, neutrality, uh, it would be reducing over that 40 years, um, almost 400 um, metric tons uh, of CO2s, uh, CO2 equivalents. But some of the others you would see might have a very high capital cost. For instance, a central utility plant, which we're studying now, would have a very significant capital cost up front um, and might, in fact, not save us uh, that much in terms of what we're burning. But it does allow us to be able to do some fuel switching. Uh, f right now, we have individual boilers in each of the buildings, uh, and each of those boilers burn natural gas. With a central utility plant, much as what our friends on uh, East Hill at Cornell University have, we're able to consider uh, large-scale switching. Could you use biomass, for instance, I have a really substantial reduction in emissions? Um, but for us, it would be a substantial change out uh, and a huge investment of capital to be able to change that out. But we are considering it because it has the long range implications of allowing us to do that fuel switching. So some of the others you actually see here, 
Transportation is some of the more difficult areas because while you have a significant, uh, or not a huge investment, it's an investment that doesn't really get you that much on the return. It's a very difficult area to, uh, to target. Uh, we basically need individuals to make some different choices. Uh, we also worked on when we would phase these things in. So things like behavior change programs we would phase in immediately. Uh, retro commissioning and completing our metering we would start very early. Uh, controls upgrades and things. Um, but major plant upgrades, a, a central utility plant, uh, things like meaningful integrations of uh, renewable energy technology would probably come down the road. So we also had that in our timing. So again, let's take a look at how we would eat that elephant, if you will. So again, scope one, the natural gas piece. You'll start to see things like behavior change, uh, implementing basically getting people not to open the windows in spaces and allowing heat to go flow right out, uh, which just adds to the natural gas consumption and doesn't really balance the space the way they think it does. Um, energy management with more controls uh, on how we're using uh, the the natural gas, sort of behind the scenes how we're maximizing use of it. Controls space management, how we actually use spaces. Do we need to keep the heat on in buildings during break periods when there might be only one or two employees in the space working. Could we move those employees to another building where the heat has to stay on because there are more people there uh, and then bring the heating down. So we're, those are some of the considerations we have. In the electricity, again, you're going to see a lot on behavior change. Again, space management. Can we turn the lights off in those spaces when we don't need to have them on? Uh, maximizing that. A lot of controls. Efficiency standards, increasing that, that helps. Um, this is in the first five years. Uh, again, a lot with behavior. Uh, you'll see, again, this speaks specifically to the solid waste impact in scope three, especially uh, getting greater buy-in for our reduction uh, and reuse uh, and recycling efforts on campus. So the first five years of our climate action plan probably have the greatest level of specificity. Uh, we looked at this and said, you know, none of us have a crystal ball to look out 40 years and know what are the new technologies coming. But we know in the short term some of the things that we need to do because we've already been doing a number of them and they've already been showing the benefits. So one thing is we needed to complete the metering of all of our campus buildings. Uh, we had meters in most campus buildings on most energy systems, but not all. So we were flying blind in those areas about how those buildings were using energy. Uh, so we needed to have more information and data on how we're actually using uh, and combusting natural gas and electricity and water. In this case, water is an important piece of this. Uh, we know we needed to increase the number of controls. Um, we needed to hire an energy manager uh, to help us manage this effort, and we did that. Uh, and she's been on board helping drive some of these other activities like retro commissioning equipment on campus. Um, retro commissioning refers to going back and making sure that the equipment you put in a building, which might get tweaked over time, uh, because people do a small adjustments when they're doing repairs and things. It might get out of a little bit of out alignment or get out of manufacturers' recommended specifications for optimum efficiency, uh, putting them back to those maximum efficiency settings. Um, things like facility design guidelines uh, and space management um, activities, some of the things we talked about, how can we uh, more effectively use the inventory of buildings that we have. Again, most of our impact is three quarters of it's related to building use. So how do we maximize the efficiency of how we use those buildings? How do we design new ones? How do we design, redesign, and, and retrofit old ones? Um, there are certain programs and policy changes that we needed to enact, um, and we're still working on some of those. Um, but uh, so these are some of the things called out in the first five years. So the major strategies we're employing in this, um, and you'll see this in both um, the facilities area and transportation, basically those scope three areas. First, we control the demand. We try to reduce as much as possible how much elect electricity and natural gas and gasoline, uh, whatever, that we're bringing in. And that's a matter of managing it effectively. Uh, behavior change, in many cases, those behavior change programs and, ha and policies and procedures that help us maximize uh, uses of those spaces. Again, things like talked about like the space management. We have not yet developed a policy and procedure to change that, but we're considering that. We also want to be improving system efficiency, so we make sure that the equipment and controls that we have are state-of-the-art, 
that they're using that energy inputs as efficiently as possible. So it's uh, direct digital controls on our building automation systems. It's uh, retro commissioning, as I mentioned. It's design standards. It's, it's all of it. And then at the end of it, do we have opportunities to switch fuels? Can we use more renewables? Uh, do, can we use wind power? Can we use solar power? Can we use solar uh, heating of hot water or even air, uh, solar heating of air, passive solar, to be doing more of our work? Uh, could we be using biomass? Again, we can't do it with individual building level at this point, but if we do consider a central utility plant, we could look to switch that. Transportation, same set of strategies, controlling demand. And this is how we start to take a look at changing behavior for commuting uh, and for business travel on the campus. Uh, and improving system efficiency. Let's make sure if we've got people commuting that they're using the most efficient mode, which might be transit, might be car sharing, ride sharing. So if you've got to drive a vehicle onto campus, can you have four bodies in it instead of one, which is very often the pattern here. Uh, and again, switching fuels down the road, we might be looking at creating uh, infrastructure for electric vehicle charging if more of our commuters are doing that. So this takes our, us down about 25 years into our plan, um, and we've talked about how we're going to get automatic benefits from the utility to get us a good share of the way and how we're going to get here, and we may actually have to uh, consider buying our way out. What... Um, one of the things we've considered, again, is if we did go with that central utility plant option, as I mentioned, what might that do for us? And you can see that actually could have a very significant impact. It would be a huge cost, a lot of disruption on the campus, but that could potentially allow us to have a really significant impact, which is why we're considering it so seriously. So, but in the last 15 years of our 40-year plan from years 16 on out, then what? Um, we've looked at um, being able to uh, do some meaningful uh, kinds of impact areas around, especially electricity. Uh, we get some of the uh, impact of the cleaning up the grid on its own. Um, and then we're also going to see uh, some significant reductions in natural gas. You notice, though, in that scope three area, that it's really difficult to get those impacts on transportation from strategic investments. Those really have to come as a result of behavior change as much as anything, taking advantage of systems uh, that exist. Although we can do more to be able to incent that. Um, but the final 25 years has the least amount of specificity. We'd like to think that uh, around the year 2026, uh, through 2050, you're going to see a lot of solar on the campus. You might, in fact, see wind turbines, if not on the campus, at least in the distance that we're buying power from, that we're going to be using all of the best practices in energy efficiency that are out there, all the best technology, and we can't potentially envision what might be coming down the road in terms of uh, high efficiency uh, technology. Uh, we know it's under development now and a lot of really exciting work going on. It can't happen soon enough. Um, and hopefully we would see, if we see vehicles on the campus at all, uh, we'd like to think we wouldn't, uh, that we would see only alternative fuel vehicles. We wouldn't see anything that's a combustion engine anymore uh, or minimal. But honestly, uh, and this was uh, something that we accepted in the course of our planning effort, absent that kind of major silver bullet, as it were, that solves all of our problems, the real answer is we don't know how we will get to the end. We know that a strategy is for whatever we cannot reduce on our own. We can, again, we could look to buy offsets to, to minimize the balance of that effort. We don't want to go there um, in any kind of a short-term way. We want to take advantage of the best options we have available for efficiency, for reducing demand, all the way along the line, pitching, switching fuels wherever we can. But um, at the end of the day, we might get there. Um, this is a chart that's really difficult to follow, but basically when you lay out all of our options, things below the line uh, would cost us money, um, but, or excuse me, would actually save us money, um, and you can see the relative degree of the impact that they would have. So J here, Geo Exchange, would cost us money, but it would have a profound impact. Um, things like air travel, uh, you can have a basically a minimal input, uh, impact if you just stopped 
doing air travel, but that's not realistic. So we have to balance that, and it doesn't have a huge impact on the overall emissions picture. N, the central utility plant, there again, this is where we start to look at having, it's gonna cost us, but it is also going to have a profound impact. Um, so this is why we're taking a look at a number of these different areas um, to, to just consider that, all of the ramifications of it. So I guess the final question is, can we really do it? Can we pull off this 40-year climate action plan? It's an aggressive uh, goal. It's not easy. It sounds 2.5% per year sounds easy. It's not. Uh, we, we struggle with that on an annual basis. Yes, we have seen some early wins, but um, it's now, you know, we've plucked most of the low-hanging fruit, uh, things that are inexpensive to do. Um, that really can have a pretty good impact. Uh, and now we get to things that are expensive, that can have a big impact. We also need to really work hard on our campus community to get them to do the things that don't cost us money, can save us a lot of money, but require them to make substantial behavior changes. Not sacrifice, but thinking about not wasting energy, thinking about combining trips, thinking about using transit, for instance. Um, so the answer is, can we do this? We think we can uh, with the full support and engagement of our campus community. Um, the keys to our success are going to be in these areas. We've got to be diligent about following the plan. The Climate Action Plan Committee meets regularly to monitor our progress, figure out what our new, you know, change things where they need to, to change, reprioritize things where they need to be, make sure that those requests get into the budget process for resource allocation. We need to rem remain vigilant about what we're doing and really watching it. We need to be adaptable too, as I mentioned with the LED technology. That was something we couldn't envision even three years ago that now has become very much uh, a preferred technology on campus. So we needed to adapt our plan accordingly. We need, again, flexibility is a key piece of this. Accountability though is a big piece of this too. Uh, again, we committed from the outset to being accountable to other institutions and the public who want to take a look at our progress. How are we doing on our emissions profiles each year? How are we doing in enacting our plan when we report our status plans? Uh, and we need to definitely keep our community engaged in this, informing them about this plan, what their role and responsibility is in this, and how critical it is that we have everyone's buy-in. So again, can we do this? I would urge you to check back in 2050 and see how we did. Thank you.